Thwaites has earned the moniker Doomsday Glacier. It's the largest, most menacing source of rising sea levels all over the world. It's already dumping 50 billion tons of ice into the ocean each year. They estimate the ice shelf on Antarctica's massive Thwaites Glacier could collapse within the next five years, causing a dramatic sea level rise. They're calling it the Doomsday Glacier. Hi, I'm Mikhail, your climate host for this virtual field lab series focused on sea level rise and Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica. If you remember from episode one, I'm an architecture student, not a climate scientist. So why am I talking to you about climate change? Well, it all has to do with Thwaites, the glacier usually referred to as the Doomsday Glacier. In episode one, Dr. Kieran Alley told us that Thwaites alone has the potential to raise sea levels by two feet. When you combine Thwaites with other sources causing oceans to rise, the current estimate is up to three and a half feet before the year 2100. This will happen during my career as an architect. Look at the simulation of a neighborhood in Miami. If we add two feet of sea level rise, you can see the number of people who will need new housing. If we add the higher three and a half feet, it potentially becomes catastrophic. You can see why people like me who design and build homes are interested in finding out if Thwaites is becoming more unstable and is really deserving of the nickname, the Doomsday Glacier. Before we dig into more data and vital signs from Thwaites, I thought it would be good to get a little more information on the basics of sea level rise. Most people don't know that the reasons that sea levels have been rising in the past are actually quite a bit different than the reasons that they will be rising in the future. Here to explain that is Megan Sharp, a friend of mine from Oregon State University. Megan is a glaciologist and an expert in melting glaciers and sea level rise. Thanks, Mikhail. So what have we learned about sea level rise over the past few decades? Well, we've learned that it's really a result of three processes, thermal expansion, melting mountain glaciers, and mass loss from the ice sheets like Greenland and Antarctica. So let's take a deep dive into those processes a little bit further. Thermal expansion is the increase in volume of water when it gets warmer. So if you don't add any extra water to the oceans, that same mass will actually take up more space if the water temperature increases. This results in an increase in sea level along the world's coastlines. Thermal expansion has been responsible for about 50% of the total observed sea level rise over the past few decades. Okay, so thermal expansion can raise sea levels without adding any additional water, but what if you do add more water to the ocean? A large source of water that gets added to our oceans is from glaciers. Glaciers across our planet act as reservoirs of water. They store water on land in the form of ice, either in the mountain ranges or in our planet's two ice sheets, Greenland in the north and Antarctica in the south. In the past few decades, melting mountain glaciers have been responsible for about 20% of the total observed sea level rise. However, 99% of Earth's ice is in the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica. So what's their role in sea level rise? The ice sheets add water to our oceans by melting and calving, a process where large chunks of the ice sheet break off and enter the ocean. Greenland and Antarctica have contributed about 30% of the total observed sea level rise combined over the past few decades. So what would happen if all of the ice in Greenland and all of the ice in Antarctica ended up in our oceans. Here's an equal area map of Greenland and Antarctica, and I want you to guess how much sea level rise that would cause. The answer is, if we melted all of Greenland, we would raise sea levels by 23 feet. And if all of the ice stored in Antarctica ended up in the oceans, we would raise sea level by about 200 feet. Now, don't worry, the ice sheets are not gonna melt entirely anytime soon but it shows us that even a small percent can make a big difference. As scientists, we still don't know how much sea level rise to expect from the ice sheets. Some projections suggest that the ice sheets have the potential to raise sea levels by multiple feet by the year 2100. This is why we need to continue learning about the processes that connect the ice sheets to Earth's climate. So what does this all mean? 
Well, over the past 30 years, we've learned that sea level rise has been a combination of thermal expansion, melting mountain glaciers, and melting and calving from the ice sheets. But looking into the future, the ice sheets have to be one of our main sources of concern because the ice sheets have the potential to raise sea level by feet, not just inches. Thanks, Michaela and Megan. Megan did a great job explaining how the big changes in sea level we expect to see in the future depend on the stability of the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. Sounds like a good reason to analyze another vital sign of Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica. In episode one, we introduced you to Thwaites. Thwaites is a major outlet glacier of the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet. This means that Thwaites lets the ice that builds up on the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet flow out to the ocean. Thwaites got the nickname of the Doomsday Glacier because if it becomes unstable, it has the potential to let much more ice flow out to the oceans, and this would raise sea levels much faster than we have seen in the past. In episode one, we talked about three critical features on the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf that we need to keep a close eye on to understand how ice flow is changing over time. The first is the grounding line. This is where the ice goes from sitting on land to actually floating on the ocean. The second are the pinning points out at the end of the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf, where there's shallow spots in the seafloor and the ice actually runs aground for a little bit. And the third spot is the ice shelf itself. The Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf is hundreds of feet thick and many miles wide, and any ice that's flowing from upstream has to go across the grounding line through the ice shelf and basically push past those pinning points in order to reach the ocean. Remember from episode one, Thwaites used to have two huge ice shelves holding back the ice, the eastern and western ice shelves. In episode one, we saw satellite images that showed a significant part of the western ice shelf catastrophically breaking up around the year 2010, leaving the eastern ice shelf as the main ice shelf now holding back the flow of ice. In this episode, we'll investigate the vital sign of the size of the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf and how that's changed over the past 20 years. Before we get started with investigating this vital sign, let me get you oriented to a few important features on the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf. Here's an example satellite image that we can look at to orient us, but we'll also try to show you some real photos and videos of these features as we go through them. Let's start with the ice shelf itself. This kind of whole smooth looking white area here is the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf and it's huge. It's more than 500 feet thick in a lot of places and it's about 13 miles wide and 25 miles long. When you fly over it in a plane, it kind of feels like it's going on forever. You might notice a lot of dark lines across the surface of the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf. These are crevasses or fractures. It's where the ice has actually broken. Sometimes that happens where the ice is sitting on land, on the grounded ice, and then those crevasses flow out onto the ice shelf with the rest of the ice, and some of them form on the ice shelf itself. Sometimes they start at the top and they break downwards, and as you can see in this diagram, many of them actually start at the bottom of the ice shelf and break upwards from there. You can see one in real life out the window of an airplane in this video. Sometimes crevasses are big enough that they go all the way through the ice shelf from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top. When they do, we call them rifts. And if a rift reaches the ocean on both of its ends, it will break a big piece of the ice shelf off and we call that piece an iceberg. You can see a bunch of broken off icebergs in this image. You can see a few other interesting things in these images. For example, you might have noticed the really super flat looking white stuff off the shore of the ice shelf. That's sea ice. This is ice that formed directly out of ocean water. If you put a glass of water in the freezer, it'll form a layer of ice on top, and if you put an ocean in the freezer, it will also form a layer of ice on top. Sea ice in the Antarctic is typically maybe three to six feet thick, although it varies a lot, but it's a lot thinner than an ice shelf. Sometimes when icebergs break off of an ice shelf, they'll get stuck in the sea ice. And you can see in these pictures some icebergs that are being held in place by the much thinner sea ice.
finally, if you see really dark black areas on these images, that's open water in the Southern Ocean. So back to the investigation. Remember, this is all about evaluating the stability of Thwaites. If the eastern ice shelf was getting bigger or staying about the same, it would be an indicator that the glacier is stable. If the eastern ice shelf is breaking up and getting smaller, kind of like the western ice shelf did, that would be a big warning sign that Thwaites is becoming more unstable. So now let's get going and do some more science. Write down this question in your notebook. What does the size of the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf tell us about the stability of Thwaites Glacier? Now we'll turn it back over to Evelina, Samsara, and Haley, who will help us with this investigation. Hi, I'm Samsara. I'm Evelina. And I'm Haley. And we're all seniors at Grant Utah High School, back to help you with more Thwaites analysis. In episode one, we analyzed the stability of Thwaites by measuring the speed of the glacier over the past 20 years. In this episode, Karen and Richard asked if we could analyze how the size of the ice shelf has changed over the past 20 years. The size of the ice shelf is a critical vital sign of analyzing the stability of an outlet glacier like Thwaites. Just like in episode number one, we can use satellite images taken over the past 20 years to make our measurements. A simple way to get an indication of the changing size of the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf is to measure the distance from the middle of the ice shelf to the edge of the ice front where the ice breaks up. This black arrow on the satellite image marks the center line of the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf. This perpendicular red line will be used to make consistent distance measurements to the ice front. Here's an actual flyover of the ice front. Before we start making our measurements, Let's make a data table. We can put the year on the left and our distances on the right. Pause the video if you need more time to make your data table. We'll start with the 2001 satellite image. Let's add a scale to the red line so we can be consistent with our measurements. Looking at the first satellite image from 2001, I would estimate the distance from the center of the ice shelf to the ice front to be about mm, 22 kilometers. Let's put that in a data table. Next, I'll bring up the image of 2005. We'll keep the measuring lines exactly the same. It looks like to me that in 2005, the ice shelf is a little bit larger. My estimate is about 23 kilometers. Remember, this is not an exact science, so our numbers may be a little different. Let's add this data to our table. Next, we'll bring up five more satellite photos taken between the years 2009 and 2022. I'll leave each image up for about 10 seconds. If you need more time, pause the video. When you're done making all the distance measurements, we'll meet you back here to help you make a graph. Welcome back. Nice job making all those measurements. Let's compare data. Here are the measurements that I made. Hopefully our data are similar. Let's make a graph in your notebook. We'll put time on the x-axis starting from the year 2000 and going up to the year 2022. The y-axis would be the size of the ice shelf. Let's start from zero and go up to 25 kilometers. Pause the video while you build your own graph. Make sure to include a trend line through your data. When you are done, hit play again and we can see how our graphs compare.
Welcome back and nice work. Let's compare graphs. Drawing a trend line that accurately tells the story of the graph was a challenge. It seems like the ice shelf was pretty stable for the first few years, then got a lot smaller. Since 2009, it looks like a pretty consistent shrinking trend. Remember, bigger ice shelves provide more stability and more resistance. Let's add some notes to your graph to show this. Before we turn this over to Karen and Richard, let's analyze the data you've collected and graphed. Let's write down two things you notice and one thing you wonder. You can pause the video while you write. And when you're finished, hit play again. Karen and Richard will come back and give us their thoughts and get us ready for episode number three. Welcome back. Thanks for all that graphing and analyzing. Here are a few things that I noticed and some things that I'm still wondering about these changes on the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf. I noticed that the edge of the ice shelf where we were measuring has retreated a lot during this time. The ice covering almost half the distance along that line that we were looking at has fallen off since 2001. We didn't make measurements on the other side of the ice shelf, but if you look at the images, it's also pretty clear that that side has retreated as well. Remember too that the Thwaites Western Ice Tongue, just to the side of the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf, completely fell apart during this time period. So between the retreat of the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf and the loss of the Thwaites Western Ice Tongue, there's not nearly as much ice shelf ice that's helping to hold back the grounded ice than there was in 2001. There's a lot that we're still wondering about the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf. One thing we wonder is whether it's likely to fall apart completely, just like the Western Ice Tongue did in the next years or decades. And there's a lot of signs, such as this reduction in ice shelf area, that suggest that it might happen in the near future. I also wonder what's going on underneath the ice shelf. Satellite images make it possible for us to see the surface really well, but it's a lot harder to see underneath, and there might be big changes happening there that we just can't see. In episode one, we saw two pieces of evidence that Thwaites is becoming more unstable. The western ice shelf catastrophically disintegrated, and the speed of the eastern ice shelf was increasing again since the western ice shelf breakup took place. In this episode, we looked at the size of the remaining eastern ice shelf. Evidence of the decreasing size also points to Thwaites becoming more unstable. Remember that we learned in episode one that it's important to look at the big picture and analyze as much data as possible to understand big changes. In episode three, we'll take a closer look at the area around the pinning points, those shallow areas of seafloor where the ice shelf runs aground. We'll also learn a bit more about predictions of sea level rise and try to understand how what we've learned in this series impacts models and projections of how much and how quickly sea level is likely to rise in the future. See you in episode three.